You know, I just wanted to share just a, for a moment. You know, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Pastor Bob and Tina are able to take this sabbatical. You know, um, and that you guys are able to provide that for them, that opportunity. Um, I can't remember where I read it, but a while back I, I ran into an article. And um, the article um, that, that placed pastoring as one of the most demanding jobs in the job market. And I think it was like fourth in, in, in demanding jobs. And what makes it so challenging is not the people. All right, like some people, you know, one pastor said, well, I'd love pastoring if it wasn't for all these people. But no, no, I mean, every pastor I have ever known loves the people they serve. They're called, they couldn't see themselves doing anything else. You know, so that's not it. But what does make pastoring so challenging? The article pointed out that it's all the different hats that a pastor has to wear. As, as Richard, you know, as, 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 as your deacon here is, is picking up some different slack, I mean, you understand that. There's a lot of hats that the pastors have to wear. And um, they're called upon to do so many things, you know, counseling and and preaching and teaching and leadership decisions and you know marketing and they need to be social person and and you know the list goes on and on bereavement specialist you know and administrator financial manager and and they wear a lot of hats and whether they're gifted in a particular area or not they still got to do the best job that they can and so Pastors are just, they're called by God to do the job that they do. And um, I know some people, I used to be ribbed a lot when I was pastoring out in South Dakota. My deacon especially would rib me. He said, well, pastor, you only work one hour a week on Sundays, you know. Come on. You know, well, they were joking. They knew that, that a lot more than that went on. Um, you know, and, and this, this, I don't know if it was this article but that said this, but Pastors, they say pastors should take a sabbatical every five to seven years. I guess the company that your wife works for understands that, that philosophy, that, that, that too, because it's important. Sometimes you just got to take some time to rest and trickle charge the batteries. You know, if you always shock charge your batteries, your batteries will wear down, they'll drain quicker. But when you take some time to just rest and trickle charge the batteries, it refreshes you. And not only pastors need to do that, people need to do that, right, yeah. you know? Right. Uh, we need to take those times. So I'm glad that you guys could, could grant that to your, your pastors. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys can go on a nice little getaway. May you be refreshed as well. All right, well, the title of my message this morning is Straining at the Oars of Life. Straining at the Oars of life. And the text I'd like us to look at is found in Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 50. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Now, how many know that, well, let's go ahead and read that first. Mark chapter 6. Now, just a little bit of a backdrop. John the Baptist had just been beheaded. And the disciples had been sent out to minister. And they came back and, and, and they were excited about all that God did in their hearts and lives and through them. And, and Jesus said, well, hey, let's, uh, let's go to a secluded place to rest. <laughs> Jesus understood how important it was after you've been ministering and pouring out to go and find a place to pray and to rest. And so they crossed the lake. But the people knew where they were going. And they ran around the, the Sea of Galilee and, and met them on the other side. And there they were. They got off the boat and there were all these people. And Jesus had compassion on the people. And he ministered to them all day long. And they come to the end of the day and the disciples were like, Jesus, send the people away. They need to go get something to eat, you know. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. So... Jesus said, do you have any food? And they brought him a couple fish and some, some bread. And, and he multiplied it. And he fed the 5,000 people. Awesome, powerful move of God there. And then that leads us to verse 45. And immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, 
while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their hearts were hardened. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your word. And I just pray you'd open up our hearts this morning to receive what you say, what you're saying to us yes. in this passage of scripture. We ask that your anointing would be upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> well, how many know that life can get pretty difficult sometimes? Sometimes we face trials. Sometimes we face storms. Maybe even today, some of you are facing a difficult situation. Maybe you've been straining hard at the oars of life. You ever been there? Where you're, you're straining and you're striving and you're pressing through and you're pushing and, and you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're going, you're pressing and you're wondering, boy, is this ever going to end? Is this ever going to end? Come on, is there, is there light at the end of the tunnel? You know, well... I pray that each one of us would receive encouragement from this passage today. Whether you're in that place today or not, someday you might be. And you'll be able to go back to this passage of scripture and be reminded and be encouraged. And it'll help you get through. See, God never promises that the Christian pil pilgrimage is going to be a bed of roses. And in fact, Jesus flat out told his disciples in John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. It's also translated difficulties, trials, sorrow. He's saying you're going to have this stuff. You're going to run into it. But he doesn't leave it there. Sort of like the passage we just read. He said, but be of good cheer in John 16, 33, for I have overcome the world. He also promises that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will never fear. What can man do to me? Amen. Romans 8, 28 says, And we all know that all things work together for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Scripture is loaded with promises. Amen. I mean, there are promises, promises, promises that we can, we can grab a hold of and we can bury in our hearts and stand upon. And we all know that trials and hardships produce what? Scripture tells us they produce patience and faith and long suffering and eventually even peace and joy that's what comes out of hardship that's what comes out of trials that's what the apostle paul and james tells us romans 5 he says not only that but we also glory in tribulation knowing that tribulation produces perseverance james tells us my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let's be honest. Counting it all joy is not the first thing that comes to my mind when I run into a trial, when I run into a difficulty, a hardship. When I face a hardship, when my faith is tested, I usually writhe, wiggle, squeal, and squirm. That's what I do. Uh, you know, or, or worse yet, I grumble about the situation or I complain. Anyone ever found themselves doing that? But that's why God gives us the word to encourage us in the way we are to go. When we face the difficult storms in life, 
He gives us the word so that we can be pointed and focused in the right direction. In fact, that's the key this morning we're going to talk about. The key is keeping our eyes on the right focus when the storms of life come crashing in. So I feel that the Lord wanted to share with you today. When I was praying about this morning, you know, this scripture came to my mind. So I said, okay, we're going to share on this scripture. I believe the Lord is telling you today, I am watching, I am aware of what's going on, I am praying for you, and I am on the way. Amen. And I don't know what you're facing individually, and I don't know what you're facing corporately as a church, but His eyes are upon you. Know that He is sitting on His throne in heaven, and His eyes are upon you. And we're going to see this from this scripture. So here in our scripture, we find Jesus. After he fed the 5,000 people, he tells his disciples. I mean, the original language brings out the idea that he constrained his disciples. He made his disciples. He urged his disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. And then Jesus went up on the mountainside to pray. Something he did, he, he drew away to spend time with his heavenly father. That's a key we should do, too. When we, when, after we've been giving up ourselves, we need to pull back. We need to be refreshed and recharged and by spending time with the Lord. So he's up on the side of this mountain praying. Now, verse 47, look at this. He says, now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Evening was between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. It was about nightfall, probably around 9 p.m., and the boat was in the middle of the sea. Now, the Sea of Galilee is about six miles across and 14 miles long. So the disciples were approximately two to three miles from shore out in the middle of, of the sea. And Jesus was on land somewhere up on the side of this mountain, right? Now, picture this. He's sitting up there. Uh, maybe on a rock or something, or under a tree, or somewhere on this mountain, praying and communing with his Heavenly Father. And from his vantage point, he could look down over that vast body of water, and he could see his disciples. He could look out, and he could see that they were straining at the oars. I mean, they were working at the oars. Matthew's Gospel, he tells the same story. And, and, and he uses the Greek word that brings out the concept that they were being buffeted. They were being tossed. They were being grievously agitated, even harassed by the waves. That's how strong the wind was. Because the wind was against them. They were rowing into the wind. Ever, anyone ever been out on a boat and you were rowing into the wind? I tell you, it's hard. You're pushing. You don't seem to make any, any headway. In other words, the wind was contrary to where Jesus had told them to go. It was Jesus that told them to get in the boat in the first place. And they were experiencing resistance. Let's stop right there for a minute. Resistance. You ever do something that Jesus told you to do only to run into strong resistance? You ever do start doing something that the Bible, the Word of God tells you to do, only to run into strong resistance? Is there anybody in the house that's ever experienced resistance in life? Well, there are some truths in this passage of Scripture that are going to bless your socks off. I get excited. I love this passage. Has anyone ever visited the Holy Land? Just side note. Anyone ever been to the Holy Land? Okay, no one. I haven't either. But I've seen pictures of the Sea of Galilee. And I've read about it. And from, from what I'm told, the Sea of Galilee is known for its sudden storms. And the disciples found themselves in the midst of one of these storms. The cool water off the Mediterranean Sea comes running down the slopes on the, under the Sea of Galilee, which I believe is below sea level. And it hits that, that water and it, it creates violent storms. So here Jesus was high up on one of these slopes and he's looking out and sees his disciples struggling. Now let's, let's pause here for a moment too. Why does the Lord sometimes direct us into difficult situations and then seem to just watch us struggle and strain? In these situations that seem unpleasant, they're, they're unpeaceful, they're agitating, they're, they're grievous. They're times when we're being buffeted. 
You know, we're being tossed about. We're being agitated. I mean, that's what the Greek words brings out in Matthew's account. When there's, when there's a constant driving force that's working against you, and, and you row, and you row, and you strain, and you strive doing what Jesus asked you to do, told you to do. And, and, and it seems like you're never getting anywhere, and you get tired, and you get weary. And sometimes when we're in that place, we ask, why? Why? I mean, we know that God is in total control. We know that he works all things together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. We know that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. We know that he's faithful to complete that which he started in our lives. But God, I'm struggling here. I'm straining, I'm striving, I'm rowing against this resistance. So the disciples find themselves in the middle of this storm and Jesus is on land and he looks out in the evening and he sees, could have been six o'clock he looked out there, seven, eight, maybe nine o'clock. Six to nine was evening in that culture in that day. So let's continue on with verse 48. It says, about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to the disciples walking on the water. Hold it now. Time out. All right, let's stop right there. Verse 47 says, now when evening came, evening was from six to nine p.m., and then verse 48 says, when it came to the fourth watch of the night, the fourth watch was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Now, if my calculations are correct, that means that the disciples were struggling in the midst of that storm anywhere from six to nine hours, possibly even 12 hours if they were in the storm at 6 p.m. and Jesus didn't come to them till the end of the fourth watch. We're not told the specific times, but we know that at least six hours they were in that storm struggling. And Jesus knew of their situation, but just sat there and watched them. Can you imagine? Here's, there the disciples were. I mean, they're struggling for their very lives. Possibly wondering, probably wondering, you know, they're being kicked about by the, by the waves. Being kicked around by life. You ever been kicked around by life? And they're probably wondering, where is Jesus? Why did he make us get into this boat and head right into the middle of this storm? Now, I, I, I ask lots of questions when I'm reading the Bible. Did Jesus deliberately direct them into that storm? Well, we can't be sure. It doesn't say. I kind of doubt that he sent them off in the middle of the storm. The storm probably started or struck once they had gotten out on the lake. Whether he knew through a word of knowledge or something that the Lord, that the storm was, was coming or not, I don't know. That's not really the point, though. But one thing is for sure, Jesus was aware of the storm and the disciples' struggle. It says, when evening came, he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. They were being tossed and buffeted by the waves. In fact, he was sitting there on the mountainside watching them in this situation for six to nine hours, watching them struggle and strain, but his eyes were upon them. He was aware he knew what they were facing. He saw the circumstance. His heart was with his disciples in that boat. But why? Why didn't he go out to them right away? Well, I think of Lazarus. Remember the story in the Bible? You know, why didn't he go and heal Lazarus when he was sick instead of after he died? Well, there are reasons for why Jesus does what he does, and there are reasons for why Jesus doesn't do what he does, doesn't do, right? You know, we all struggle with different things at different times, and struggle causes anguish and pain, and it can deplete our joy. And the disciples were in anguish and pain at this moment, and, and, and they were wondering, you know, where is Jesus? Why did he send us into the storm? And maybe we wonder sometimes, where are you, God? But the encouragement we find in this scripture is that God was there and he was aware. So point number one, he was watching. 
Point number two, he was praying. He was praying. I have no doubt that while Jesus was watching his disciples struggle with the oars in the midst of that storm, that he was praying for them. Praying that their faith would not fail. Praying that the Holy Spirit would strengthen them. Praying. Jesus was praying for them. I mean, that's why he went up on the mountainside in the first place. To pray, right? And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8.34 that Jesus is also praying for you and me. It tells us that Jesus is at the right hand of God, the Father, interceding for us. In Hebrews 7.25 says, it says that he even ever lives. He ever lives to make intercession for us. You know, Hebrews 4, um, 14 encourages us, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet was without sin. Therefore, it says, let us come boldly to the throne room of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So number one, Jesus was watching. Number two, Jesus was praying. And I like this third point. Jesus is coming. So Jesus was praying for his disciples and is praying for you. But that's not all. That's not where the story stops. We also note that our script, in our scripture that Jesus will come to you. Sometimes Jesus allows us to struggle. Sometimes we come to these times of struggle and we often feel like Jesus is nowhere to be found. That he could care less about our present circumstance and situation. Have you ever felt like that? I sure have. I don't know about anyone else, but I have. But that's, that's what I love about this scripture and the encouragement that's found therein. Because it not only tells me that Jesus is aware of the resistance, that he's aware of the struggle, and, and that he does care, and that he is praying that my faith not fail, that he is at the right hand of God the Father interceding for me. It also tells me that there will come a time there will come a time when Jesus will come walking triumphantly over the wind and over the waves. It tells me that there will come a time. He, it will be the right time. It will not be too early. It will not be too late. But Jesus will come walking triumphantly over the swelling of the waves, over the resistance of the wind, whatever the buffeting wind, whatever the buffeting waves and the resistance of the wind may be in your personal circumstance or your situation situation right smack dab in the middle of it he will come victorious and he will say take courage take courage my child Amen. I'm telling you Jesus just just as he did for the disciples he told he told the disciples to take courage he tells you and I the same thing today take courage that's a word for you today church take courage and when the creator of the universe speaks the one who spoke everything into existence. When he speaks a word into your heart, something happens. Some, I mean, things begin to shake. Things begin to move. Light dispels darkness. His word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Divides between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And is a discerner between the thoughts and intents of the heart. I mean, when Jesus speaks, things happen. See, things can't stay the same when Creator God speaks a word into your heart. I can't even begin to imagine, and to, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you all the times I've knelt at different altars in my life, in my turmoil, in my grief, in my struggle, in my despair, in my pain, suffering, and anguish. And God, with just a word, with just a single word, stilled the storm and strengthened my heart and encouraged me. I remember back in 1992, I was participating in a six-month church planting internship in Bergenfield, New Jersey, with the North East Urban Church Planting Organization. And see, what they would do is they'd pull together a group of college interns. I was in college at that time. And they would place them with a pastor who was planting a church. 
And I and five other interns, some from CBC's Central Bible College, some from Trinity, and um, I'm not sure if there were any other colleges in our group, but they placed us five, six interns with, with Pastor Ralph Fiorelli in Bergenfield, New Jersey to help plant a church. And Bergenfield is a community that's about five miles, square miles. And it has about a population of 25,000 people in that five square miles. And it's located just five miles from Manhattan. So I mean, it's right there in the heart of things, Manhattan, New York. And I remember the director, Otto Wagner. Um, he told us when we first arrived that we were entering into a spiritual pressure cooker. All right? And that there would be resistance to what we were trying to do. And that whatever was below the surface in our hearts would come up. And would no doubt, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what pressure cookers do, right? I mean, they, they press in. And that's what happens in the midst of pressure. So he was just forewarning us to expect that and to not be surprised when it happened. And I'm telling you, you ain't kidding. I mean, that, that, that's what pressure cookers do. That's what trials do. That's what afflictions do. That's what suffering does. They bring up to the surface what's really there deep down in our hearts. Well, he was right. It wasn't but a month or two into that internship, that intense ministry situation. I mean, we were pressing into the kingdom of darkness by planting a church right smack dab in the middle of it. I mean, you just wouldn't believe the things that we ran into as we canvassed the community and went door to door and, and we were holding Friday night outreaches in the park and we were reaching out to the kids at the local pool hall and, and we were helping with Sunday services and we were preaching and teaching and helping out with a ministry called the Valesburg Project located in the inner city of Newark, New Jersey. And, and it didn't take long. It didn't take long for, for us interns fresh from Bible college to start feeling the pressure to start feeling the squeeze that was being put on us by life and its circumstances and even the kingdom of darkness. After all, we were invading the enemy's territory, helping to establish a beachhead of light in a community that had no Pentecostal witness. And he didn't like it. <clears throat> he didn't like it at all. And I remember one evening, we were participating in a service in Caldwell, New Jersey at the Caldwell AG Church. And I was hurt. I was feeling the squeeze. The storm was raging around me. And, and I felt like I was going down for the third time. I was distraught. I was in great distress. You get the point, right? And, and I went to the altar at the end of that service. And I knelt there looking to my Lord and Savior. And the musician began to sing a song. Some of you maybe remember it. Maybe you've never, never known this song. But it was, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news. Announcing peace. Proclaiming news of happiness. And that's what we were doing. That's what we were trying to do. But we were just experiencing the pressure. And all this stuff was coming up in my heart and my life. And I was, felt like I was going down for the third time. But God did something with this song in my heart that evening. He said, take courage, Mark. You are, have lovely feet. You're bringing good news. You're announcing peace. You're proclaiming news of happiness. And then it goes into our God reigns. Our God reigns. Then it, then it swells into this chorus. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. And I can't even begin to explain what happened in words. My God came walking triumphantly over the winds and the waves, right straight through all the resistance and all the turmoil, into, and, and encouraged and strengthened my heart. It's one of those moments I'll never forget. Yes. I'll never forget it. He came into my tight spot and made it a broad place. And I, I remember another time. I can't remember where it was or what the circumstance was. But again, I found myself at an altar crying out to God in my doubt and my confusion. And I knelt there feeling hopeless and helpless. And I thought to myself, 
I sure, it sure would be neat to hear that song again. You know, because that other time was so special. It was so powerful. God had so ministered and encouraged my heart with that song. As he, as he spoke it into my heart, I thought, oh, it would be so neat to hear that song again. And no sooner had I thought the thought. It wasn't even a prayer. I just thought the thought that the musician, the piano player, began to... Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Transitioned right into that song. How lovely are the mounds are the feet of him who brings good news. And there it was again. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Yes. And my heart was encouraged once again. Jesus once again came walking triumphantly over the wind and the waves that were raging about me. And he will do the same for you when you're in that place as well. You know, often the difficult times in life have a way of drawing us closer to Jesus, if we'll allow them to. But let's look again at our scripture. So Jesus was walking triumphantly over the wind and the waves. And the latter part of verse 48 says this, And he would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. So here's the problem. Having looked at our scripture thus far, we realize that Jesus will come to us in our trials. But we do not always recognize Jesus when he does come. The disciples didn't recognize him at first. Warren Worsby asked the questions, why? Why did they, the disciples, not recognize Jesus? He further went on to explain, because they were not looking for him. Had they been waiting by faith, they would have known him immediately. Instead, he goes on to say, they jumped to the false conclusion that the appearance was that of a ghost. Fear and faith cannot live in the same heart, for fear always blinds the eyes to the presence of the Lord. See, this is just what happens. We get to straining, we get to struggling, we get to striving and fighting against the wind and the waves, those difficult situations that come against us. But before you know it, our focus... Everyone say focus. focus. Our focus is on the circumstance and the trial. Our focus gets on the difficulty. Our focus gets on that person that we're having the issue with. Our focus gets on the resistance. Our focus is looking and consumed with the enemy and not on Jesus. Now let's go on and see what this did to Peter. We're going to go back to Matthew's account in Matthew 14, 28. Same passage, different gospel. It says, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And what does Peter do? How many are familiar with the story? Peter answers him and says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. Remember when God's, when, when the creator of the universe speaks a word, you know, something happens. So Peter, by faith, steps out of that boat got down out of that boat and started walking on the water and going towards Jesus. And the apostle Peter steps out of the boat in faith and starts heading to Jesus. But then something happened. The Bible says that when he saw the wind and he, and, and he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. And what does Jesus do? He immediately reached out his hand and caught him and he picked him up. And he said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, I find this funny. I don't know about anyone else, but here he is walking on the water. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. I mean, I scratch my head at, the, at that one. When's the last time you walked on the water? Anybody here? Yeah, you know, little faith. I mean, it had to take faith for, for Peter to even get out of the boat, right? Go in the water. But Jesus was pointing out something. He was pointing out 
that it was the fear, it was the doubt that overtook Peter's faith when he began to, and he began to sing. One commentator said, true faith must persevere and does not end with the initial step when the initial step has been taken. Peter had great beginning faith and was doing fine until his eyes got off of Jesus, until his focus left Jesus and went to the wind and the waves. So here we have Peter wavering between two opinions, which that's what doubt's all about. You're wavering between two opinions. You know, he's looking at Jesus, and then he starts looking at the problem. He's looking at Jesus, and he starts looking at the problem. But then the gust of wind comes by, and he feels it, and maybe, he, maybe it kicks some spray up into his face off one of the top of the waves. Maybe he looks over and he sees a couple of waves starting to come his way, and his focus, his perspective gets off. He's looking at Jesus, then he looks at the storm. It can happen so easily to any one of us. He was focused on Jesus, then that gust of wind hit him in the face, and he gasps. And he looks to the left, and a couple of waves are coming his way. And he loses his focus, and he begins to sink. You know, another commentator points out this. He says, it was not the danger of the wind and the waves that threatened Peter's life. It was the littleness of his faith. Hmm. You know, I had lost my focus on that internship as well. And I began to sink. All this stuff was coming up within me. And all this stuff was coming from without. And maybe you're here today. And you'd say, you know, Pastor Mark, I can see how I've lost focus too. I'm not looking to Jesus. I'm looking at the problem. I'm so wrapped up in this problem that I haven't looked at Jesus in, in a day or a week or a month. You know, the glorious thing is, that man's weakness becomes God's opportunity to help. And he is so merciful and he is so willing to help. And we see in this situation that Peter did the right thing. He cried out, Lord, save me. I mean, he cried out. And in my situation back there in New Jersey, I was in the right place. I was at an altar crying out, Lord, help me. And Jesus reached down and took Peter by the hand and lifted him up. And they walked to that boat and the wind and the waves died down. And he reached down and he lifted me up. And he, I, we, peace came. In whatever circumstance you find yourself in today, take courage. Look to Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the author and finisher of your faith. And He is always faithful. He will never let you sink. If you're going down for the third time, just cry out those three words. Jesus, help me. Jesus, save me. And if you can't cry out those three words, just cry out one word. Jesus. I don't know how many times I've just said, Jesus. And He came. And he helped. He will meet you right where you are at. And here in a few minutes, I'd like to provide you an opportunity. If you find yourself there today and you need it, I'd like you to find a place at this altar. Amen. And cry out to God. But I'd like to draw, not quite yet, not quite yet, but I'd like to draw one more point before we move into an altar call. You know, for Peter, he saved him. He lifted him up, and then, I want you to get this, he dealt with the root issue in Peter's heart. For Peter, it was his littleness of faith. It was the doubt that overtook him. For me, he reached down and pulled me up, then he dealt with my root issue. That's another sermon for another time. But the point is this, he doesn't just want to save you from your circumstances. He doesn't just want to save you from your situations. He doesn't just want to save you from the wind and the waves, from the resistance that's coming against you. He wants to touch that area. He wants to touch and deal with that emotion that comes up, whether it be anger or, or, or doubt or weariness or, or, or lack of faith. He wants to touch that feeling. He wants to touch that perception. He wants to deal with that reaction. He wants whatever that thing is, which the resistance, which the struggle, which the pressure is bringing up in you, that's the redemptive thing about trials and hardships. 
And Jesus is so good at pinpointing whatever that area is for each one of us. For Peter, it was the littleness of faith. For me, at, back in New Jersey, it was a wrong concept I was carrying of God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit will be so faithful to pinpoint, to touch, and to heal whatever that area is for you. You know, we can learn lots from this section of Scripture. It's loaded with truth. And may it increase our faith so that when hard times come, we can stand strong in the Lord. Yes. That we would, with the eyes of faith, look for Jesus and know that He is there, even if we don't sense Him or see Him, or it seems like He's far away, or He's nowhere to be found, know that He is there. And oh, that we would not fear and that we would not doubt but that we would be patient and endure through the trial. Taking this passage of scripture and knowing that he is watching, yes. he is praying, he will come walking triumphantly over the wind and the waves of our circumstances and situations. And in the midst of it all, God, the God of the universe, in his great wisdom, will use the situation to deal with the root issues in our heart and will work his good pleasure and his will into our life. Yes. Amen. I'm going to ask um, Richard to come and begin to play. As I wrap it up, Jesus made the disciples get into that boat and soon they found themselves in the middle of a storm. Sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of a storm or a trial, a difficulty, where we feel the pressure, where we feel the resistance, where we come to our wit's end. Well, if you're there today, I want you to know that God is just one inch past your wit's end. He's just one inch past your wit's end. He cares. He's there, and He will catch you if you just... Launch yourself into his arms. You know, I'd like to open up this altar and give you an opportunity to find a place with God. And the encouragement we find in this passage of scripture is to know one more time. Repetition is the key to learning. We repeat things over a few times so that we can get it into our hearts. So that it can be planted there. The seed of God's word, which is powerful, can take root and grow, be planted, take root and grow and produce fruit for his glory, his honor, and his kingdom. Jesus is watching. He's aware of your situation. He's praying for you. He will come to you walking triumphantly over whatever it is. Is it a physical problem that you're maybe struggling with? Jesus is in the house today. And when Jesus is in the house, the healer's in the house. When Jesus is in the house, the deliverer is in the house. When Jesus is in the house, the Savior's in the house. When Jesus is in the house, the Redeemer's in the house. When Jesus is in the house, the Forgiver is in the house. The list goes on and on and on. Whatever it is, your whatever your need is, Jesus is in the house. He's in the house. Is it a financial problem? Jehovah Jireh. Our provider is in the house. Is it a relational problem? You know, Jesus understands relational problems. And he can come into those storms as well. And he can help with his grace, with his hand, with his touch. Is it a sin problem? You know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. For the cleansing away, the washing of the way, and the remission of our sins. They are paid for in full. I don't care what it is. Jesus paid the price. He sees, he cares, and he is there. Looking at Peter in this passage, we can learn a powerful key, which was, which had to do with his focus. You can choose to focus on your circumstance and let it divert your attention away from Jesus, or you can choose to cry out to him and say, 
I'm putting my focus on you, Jesus. And allow him to speak a word into your heart that will change everything. And when he does, I'm telling you, there is nothing like it. There is nothing in this world like when Jesus comes and he speaks a word directly into your heart. It is quickening. It is powerful. You know, I'm a thrill seeker. I love, I love to, to, to go on roller coasters. I used to skydive and, and we snorkel. My wife and I snorkel. And I mean, I just, we just love to do things like that. I love to, 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 I used to drive, ride, uh, race dirt bikes. I'm a thrill seeker. But there is nothing more thrilling. I have experienced nothing more thrilling than the presence of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His Holy Spirit. I, the most thrilling times of my life have been times at the altar, kneeling before my Almighty God when He spoke the right word at the right time into my heart. Oh, it just gives me goosebumps just thinking of it. Jesus, he is the most wonderful thing. Praise the name of Jesus. So if you're there today and you need to, I'd like to invite you to find a place at this altar as Richard leads us in a closing song. I asked him to maybe do his, the second song he sang today. It, it's, it's so awesome. I love that song. It really was spoke into my message. So whether you come forward or whether you stay in your seats, just open up your heart and let, let this song minister to you as Richard sings it to us. And then I'll come up and close in prayer. Why don't you stand with me?